Hello, welcome to Pod Songs. I'm Jack Stafford, and I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today's guest is an opinion columnist at the Washington Post. She frequently covers economics, public policy, immigration, and politics, with a special emphasis on data-driven journalism, for which she's won many awards. She's also an economic and political commentator for CNN, a special correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, and many other positions. Please welcome Catherine Rampol. Okay, well, so thanks so much for speaking to agreeing to speak to me, an unknown little podcaster like me, getting to speak to big famous journalists like you. I'm very excited. Well, it's a really cool concept. And I have a soft spot in my heart for um, songwriters. So, um, oh, thank you. Delighted to join you. Thank you. I'm flattered that you invited me. Well, I have no idea what a song. What, you asked me what we could write a song about, and um, I was hoping you could, <laughs> because yeah, I mean, you, what you cover is a. I mean, you cover a big area, and you know? I mean, you're you you mostly write about economics, and that's everything. That is everything. Um, Economics is a pretty imperialistic discipline in that it can be almost any anything you can imagine. You know, I write about healthcare, taxes, education, um, public health sometimes, in addition to, you know, the, the provision of healthcare, um, immigration, thinking what else I've written about recently. Uh, so, you know, I think of economics in a way as a lens for looking at a, a bunch of important issues and a, a framework as opposed to a, a particular uh, strict topic area. It must be an interesting time for you because you must be having to do an about face because you've spent four years of, well, how to put, how to put it nicely, um, critiquing uh -huh. uh, policies. And now you're on the, now the, the tide has turned and hopefully I assume you're going to be a little more positive in your pieces. I, I will say that the discussion now about economic policy issues, um, I think, is more capable of nuance and more capable of uh, sort of substantive good faith disagreements. Whereas in the previous four years, um, the past administration, the Trump administration, was just so sloppy about everything that they did that they wouldn't do even like their most basic homework about, you know, what happens if you impose a tariff on an allied country, for example. Like maybe they'll do the same thing back to you. <laughs> maybe that will affect your own companies and consumers and um, and, and in fact, even if there isn't retaliation, um, maybe there will be some harm to, to uh, your own people. And so it was much easier to just be like, nope, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. We, you know, there's plenty of research on X, Y, and Z thing that is being proposed. Whereas now I think, uh, I, I actually do sometimes disagree with the Biden administration on their economic policy uh, approaches, but... Um, I, I think that they are trying to do their homework at the very least. And, um, you know, there are a lot of uncertainties about the kinds of things that they are proposing or, or trying to do. Um, and it, it's, it's, so it's, it's actually, I think, harder to come up with in, in a sense, like clear cut, X idea is bad or X idea is good um, type takes for what I do. I mean, I write an opinion column. I'm supposed to have an argument, right? I'm supposed to say, here is my thesis about this thing that's in the news. And in a way, it was a little bit easier to do before because like <laughs> some of the ideas that were being proposed or enacted for that matter were just so overtly bad that it was like, hmm. you know, not a lot of gray area. And now it's like, well how big should the stimulus be? Or um, what happens if you, uh, I don't know, 
try to address affordable housing through this means versus that means. There's a lot more uncertainty. And and again, I think room for good faith disagreements with people uh, across the political spectrum. Yeah, I mean, just to go back to those days of Trump, I mean, looking back, you can look at it back like one of those amusement park rides where you thought you were going to die or maybe, a, <laughs> you know, this car crash, you survived and you just, you know, it has its aspects that you can laugh about now. And do you, do you are you slightly nostalgic? I mean, no, or also, no. Definitely not. I'm, in, in a sense, as I said, parts of my job were easier because there were just um, lots of things to get angry about. And, you know, fury mm. is good fodder for an opinion column. Um, and lots of uh, that, uh, lots of things that were being done that were just like so obviously bad. Again, um, easier to write a a, a clean thesis without caveat or with fewer caveats and disclaimers. So in a sense, there were parts of my job that were easier, but mm -hmm. I just don't think it, it was conducive to, well, first of all, that whole period was extremely stressful <laughs> um, <laughs> because it felt like there were just unending catastrophes and drama, um, of course. And um, in a way, lots of, Lots of very bad things that were happening on a on the policy level that were not getting a lot of coverage. So even if there were things that I found, you know, a little bit easier to write about, they would sometimes get crowded out by whatever the latest um, uh, palace intrigue or Trump tweet or whatever was. So I was writing a lot about immigration, for example. There were a lot of um, uh, sort of obscure, non-transparent things happening to the immigration system that had really consequential impact on people's lives. Um, and in my view were obviously bad things to do and sometimes illegal things to do, but they would get crowded out by other stuff. So um, I don't know. I, I definitely do not feel nostalgic about that period, even if in some ways um, there was more fodder for my column. Uh, but I, I, I am much more hopeful about the leadership that we have now and here in the United States, the, 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 the fact that those in power, even if I often or sometimes disagree with them are trying to get to the right answer, um, and not just trying to line the pockets of the guy in charge, mm. um, do you or, think they had like a, a deliberate strategy to, to to suck the oxygen out of the air, like Chavez? You know, be so outrageous that there's no space to discuss the finer points of immigration apart from a huge wall. <laughs> um, you know, there there has been there was this ongoing debate here in the United States about how deliberate Trump's strategy was. I, I think he he definitely had an instinct for how to suck all of the oxygen out of the room and. Um, control the news cycle in a way that most other people just don't have that talent, if you want to call it that. Uh, whether he was really being methodically strategic about it is a separate question, right? Is it just he's a sh he's a natural showman and he knows how to get a lot of attention, or was it you know, aha, if I tr tweet something outrageous now, that will distract from some investigation into something bad that I've done or my mishandling of COVID or whatever. I, I think it was not that explicit. The, the analogy mm -hmm. that got used here a lot, I don't know if this is, if this is common elsewhere, was, was Trump playing um, five-dimensional chess or was he just eating the checkers pieces? <laughs> and um, <laughs> And I'm inclined to think he was eating the checkers pieces but in a way that was still very effective at winning whatever the board game was. So, um, so a, a lot of the, the serious consequential stuff that he did didn't get, I think, sufficient attention. And we're kind of dealing with the consequences of that now here in the States. Um, you know, there was a lot of damage done to all sorts of government institutions, not just the immigration, not just the immigration system. Although I, I, as I said, I, I wrote pretty extensively about that, but, you know, other government agencies that regulate 
um, the environment or diplomacy, our State Department got kind of cleared out. Um, so there was a lot of stuff happening kind of uh, under the radar that just wasn't as easy to grasp, I think, as whatever the crazy Trump tweet was. And so didn't get as much attention. And now we're kind of seeing how difficult it is to repair much of that damage. Yeah, because you just voted through the 1.3 billion, 1.3 trillion stimulus bill, but I think that Trump gave tax cuts of two billion, two trillion. So I can't, I'm not even used to saying the word trillion. I'm, I'm, so I, yes, uh, uh, you're not based in the states, right? So no, so, okay, I, I'm in Italy. You're yeah. in Italy, okay, that's what I thought. Um, so I'm, uh, I, I don't know how you know Americans think that the world revolves around us and everybody knows what's going on in our uh, news environment, but I. I sort of assume that that is not the case, but you have a good memory. Um, yeah, Trump passed a two trillion dollar tax cut in 2017 that was not funded, um, meaning that it added two trillion dollars to the deficit, um, and that was when the economy was doing well and didn't necessarily need any sort of stimulus. He did oversee quite a bit of uh, fiscal relief or stimulus, whatever you want to call it, last year as well, um, related to, to the coronavirus. Uh, so the deficit did go up quite a bit um, under his stewardship. And there were other big spending bills and things like that while he was president. Um, now, you could argue that you, the United States is in a relatively unique position. We have, we're, you know, we are privileged to have the world's reserve currency Everybody, everybody around the world is eager to lend us money, which means maybe we can borrow. We have the ability to borrow a lot more than other countries do. Um, and certainly that's true to some degree. The question is, were those, can, can, can you, you know, take that argument <laughs> um, so far that, that you basically say that deficits don't matter at all and you can borrow an infinite amount and what's the deficit now then what's the total that's a good question the, the the annual deficit here i don't actually know what it is um i know that as debt as a share of gdp is i think over 100 percent right now but i don't know what the um, is that a bad thing or can you operate i mean I'm, well as i uh, said i mean to some extent the rules don't the same rules that the rest of the, the world has to abide by don't really abide don't really apply to the United States, because we have, for now, we have the world's reserve currency, which means people want to buy our debt because they want okay. dollars. Um, so uh, there is a question as to, you know, whether, whether what there's- if like whether, Bitcoin comes or, through? Or, yeah. <laughs> Bitcoin. Um, you know, there have been people who have argued, well, the United, if something can't go on forever, it won't. I don't know if you know that that expression, right? Yeah, and yeah, it's, for sure. at some point, um, the chickens will come home to roost. Um, people will decide that the amount of debt that the United States holds is so burdensome that um, you know that there is a risk of default or of inflation or the kinds of things that happen to other countries generally, mm. um, and then. And then that will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people are worried about it, then they'll be less likely to lend to us or interest rates will go up, et cetera. Um, so, so far that hasn't happened. Um, and I think as long as the United States continues paying its bills, then mm. it won't be so much an issue. But, you know, in other countries, the experience has been People are willing, people, companies, you know, investors are willing to lend to you up until the point that they're not. And that can come very quickly. So there is some risk that the United, you know, that the, the laws of gravity will apply at some point to the United States. Maybe we're not there yet, but it is something there. There are some constraints on our ability to borrow, even if we don't know exactly where they are, which is why it's wise to be um, somewhat mindful of at least prioritize if we're going to. If we're going to spend more money, if we're going to cut taxes, prioritize the things we want to do um, and think about those kinds of trade-offs and don't just spend infinite amounts of money because at some point, um, you know, we do have to pay it back. Uh, interest rates will go up, uh, presumably on the other side of this pandemic recession. 
and it will be more costly for us to borrow, even if people are still willing to lend to us. And do you think Biden is going to turn roll back those those tax cuts? Um, so it's interesting. Biden has kind of boxed himself into a corner where he has said he will not cut taxes on anyone. Excuse me, he will not raise taxes on anyone making less than four hundred thousand dollars a year. So the Trump tax cuts cut taxes pretty much across the board. The biggest cuts went to wealthy people, but there were middle class people, there were lower income people who also got tax cuts. And so Biden has basically committed to not reversing those. Okay. Um, and he has perhaps implicitly also committed to not levying other kinds of taxes like a VAT. You know, basically every other country in the world has a VAT. The United States does not. Um, and, and, you know, as, as I'm Different sure you know, you're in yeah. it. Yeah, I'm sure you're in Italy. Uh, you you probably pay a vet on almost everything you buy, right? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so regardless of your income. So things like that would be ruled out um, as well. So it will be difficult, I think, for Biden to be able to um, fulfill all of the different commitments he's made about paying for things, but also not paying for things by raising taxes on people who are not rich Again, rich here is defined as anybody making less than $400,000 a year, which in the United States is, is I think, you know, only the top 2% of households. So that's that's basically excluding the vast majority of people from from paying anything more in taxes. And, and there are other kinds of taxes that he might consider as well, not just for their revenue raising purposes, but for other social purposes like a carbon tax mm. and um, or gas tax. And there is a question about whether he would, uh, according to the metrics he set for himself, whether he would be open to those kinds of things, given that he has put his foot down and said no new taxes for anybody who is not, you know, mm. again, basically in the bottom 98% of the income distribution. So you think he's going to roll back some of Trump's, did Trump do anything good in his, I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day. It, may, it must be some policies that were oh, good, no? Um... You know, take, I've take been asked time. this before. Take your time. Let me think. Yeah, Let me think. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there, there are some things that I thought were fine. Um, they were not the things that necessarily I cared the most about. You know, he, uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to obtain medical care here in the United States, but it's a very complicated system. Mm -hmm. and um, And most of the things that, the Trump administration tried to do related to the healthcare system, I think were not helpful, but he did pursue one thing that I think was useful, which is try to get more price transparency on if you show up at a hospital, how much will you be charged? Because that's like an impossible thing to know really? now. Um, so he, he did, do, I don't know how successful it was, but there, there was some effort to get more price transparency and I'm generally in favor of that. But again, you know, on, on most major issues that I pay attention to, um, I do not have particularly flattering things to say about the Trump record. Mm. So what's going to happen with health? Well, while we're on the topic of health care, because so, you ha so complicated. So you had Obamacare, then there was Medicare. Is there some? What? So it is, uh, some of that is right. So Medicare has been around for a very long time. And it is generally only um, available to people over age 65 and you pay into the system through payroll taxes during your working life. Um, and then once you turn 65, you are eligible for this government, uh, insurance plan. You, you pay some premiums depending on your income. Um, but it's a relatively generous program. Uh, and, and as I said, that's been around for, for decades and decades. For everybody else, there's kind of this patchwork system where you either get your insurance through your employer, um, and the employer might pay part of your premium or all of your premium if it's a really, you know, sweet setup. People, people, are, happily, don't have that. people are happy with that, though. Yes. Um, for the most part, if you look at surveys, people are happy with their employer-sponsored insurance plans. Then there are other people who are on other kinds of public insurance. Uh, there's a program called Medicaid, which is for lower-income people. and um, 
you know, there's basically the, 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 the two main things that Obamacare did were expanding who was eligible for Medicaid. So they said, okay, you can be kind of still low income, but not as low income and, and, and qualify. And uh, you could buy an individual insurance plan um, on a private market, essentially, and that would be subsidized. And there would be some um, protections, regulations in place so that the price of that insurance would be more affordable to you. And they couldn't discriminate against you if you had pre-existing conditions, you had cancer or something like that. It used to be that an insurance company, if you were buying one of these individual market plans, could say either we're not going to sell you insurance because you have a history of cancer and we think that it'll be too expensive to cover you, or well, they're going to charge you such a high rate for that insurance that we will, um, that you won't be able to afford mm. it. And so they, they kind of set up the marketplace so that there would be more people who could access that insurance. And, um, and it, it did a lot of other things too, but those are like the main things in, in terms of expanding insurance coverage. And for many years, the uh, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, um, it's the same law, just different names, was not very popular until Trump and uh, Republicans in Congress tried to repeal it and people actually realized what it did and what would happen in its absence and you know, all these people who had been on Medicaid would lose their insurance, all these people who had um, had subsidies and protections to buy insurance on the individual market would lose their insurance. So it became more popular um, and was and, and the, th the threats to the law were probably a large part of the reason why Democrats ended up um, retaking at least one of the houses of, of our legislature here in 2018. Is that right? Yeah, 2018. Um, but it's still not perfect, and there are still a lot of people who aren't covered. There are a lot of people who are covered but still have very unaffordable um, plans if they get sick, they have a huge dedu deductible, you know, things like that. So they can still have very high bills. So more certainly needs to be done, but there's a lot of disagreement here in the United States about how you fix it, um, both as a matter of what's the, the best possible design and what's politically feasible. Mm. Because here in the United States, you know, the there are a lot of stakeholders who are happy with the current system and um, might stand to lose out if you change the way doctors are compensated or hospitals are compensated or who has access to care or, or what have you. So, so we were, we were, you were describing this, this, this strange four headed beast, which is the American healthcare yes. insurance, system, which has evolved into this strange tangle of wool, which you can never unravel. <laughs> so you're kind of adding little pieces to it all the time to, to break it down. It's just going to break too many hearts and cause too much confusion. Well, confusion and, you know, there's, there's money to be lost. Um, there was an economics professor that I knew in college who, who had this universal law of, of healthcare, which is that every dollar of waste, fraud, and abuse, um, which American politicians love to, to rail against, they're going to get rid of waste, fraud, and abuse, Every dollar of waste, fraud, and abuse is somebody else's dollar of income. So um, if you try to save money by, um, you know, getting rid of duplicative tests or um, uh, covering, deciding, you know, only certain people will qualify for certain kinds of coverage or certain kinds of care, uh, somebody stands to lose out. So, uh, so someone's one person's waste is another person's profit, right? And so mm -hmm. that's one of the, one of many complications for redesigning our healthcare system, because among other things, here in the United States, we pay basically the highest prices anywhere in the world for that's incredible no? for care, not just for prescription drugs, yeah. but for everything. You know, if you have an appendectomy or you have uh, knee surgery or an x-ray, uh, chances are you're going to end up paying a lot more here. It, you, I say you, but I mean the, you know, the, the price charged by the provider, which whether that's paid by the insurance company or the individual or some combination of the two. 
um, it costs a lot more here. So one of the challenges with expanding coverage is how do you do it in a more, uh, in a sustainable and, and affordable way? If you are going to cover a lot more people, um, probably to, to, you know, just to be mindful of the dollar amount, um, because you don't, there aren't infinite resources, you have to figure out, well, how do you make sure that the additional money that's being spent on coverage and on care is actually improving people's lives um, and making people better and isn't just being frittered away in, in some respect. And so it's it's not like you can just change one aspect of the healthcare system. You, everything is interconnected, right? So you have mm. to, so there are a lot of moving parts and any attempt to change one of them has tons of knock-on effects and people, some people are hurt by those and some people are helped by those. And anyway, it's just a big thorny mess. And, (laughs) um, and as a result, uh, people have come to very different conclusions about the way to improve the healthcare system. You know, do you just try to like tear it all down and start from scratch? Um, and I, and I think that there is a certain appeal to that idea, given that that's a, it's what Bernie wanted to do. Isn't it, it is. Um, the challenge is, is that feasible, right? Because there are so many entrenched interests that stand to benefit from, benefit from the current system. And not all of them are just like greedy, you know, whatever, greedy hospitals or something. Um, you know, it's complicated to change things. It, it, the other issue is that, as you just mentioned, people like their employer-sponsored insurance, for the most part. And so if you just tell them, don't worry, we're going to tear it all down and come up with something better off. Will Mm. there be voters who just take that on faith or will they say, no, I remember how, um, uh, rough and buggy, you know, previous attempts to improve the healthcare system have been. And I don't trust that that will work in which case, um, voters will rebel and vote people out of office. And maybe there's some middle ground where you can say, okay, we're going to try to get more insurance to uh, people who aren't covered and more generous insurance to people who are underinsured or whatever um, that doesn't involve tearing down the whole system. And so there's like this sort of debate about what's the right approach, again, as a matter of good policy and um, political feasibility. And there are a lot of you know unknowns about how different actors within this system would respond, you know, if you made some changes versus others. So it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a big complicated problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you have to make sense of this. this is your, I mean, when I need an idea for a song, I have an interview and, and most journalists, you know, if they, when they need an idea for a story, they just interview someone, but you, you're an opinion. So you have to interview yourself. Well, so. I, I interview a lot of experts. I mean, I consider myself, I, I'm an opinion columnist and, and my job is to write, as I said, an argument about something that I think is worthwhile for people to pay attention to, whether it's some breaking news or some longer term structural issue, like how to fix the healthcare system. Um, but I still do a lot of reporting. I spend much of my day reading um you know, research uh, from by academics or looking at data sets or calling experts in various fields and asking them, well, you know, what do you think about this issue or what do you think about this approach? Some of, some of that is about stress testing my own ideas to see if um, the people who really specialize in any particular subject that I'm writing about think that I'm off base. Some of this is, is getting more information from them about what they've looked at and what they've learned and what their concerns are. Um, and, you know, some of it is is trying to figure out um, where the sources of disagreement are on any particular issue and, and why they exist and, and how to sort through them. So, uh, you know, the, obviously, there's there's a fair amount of uh, there's some introspection that goes on because I I ultimately have to come to a conclusion about whatever it is I'm writing about and try to write about it convincingly. But I do try to do a lot of reporting, um, and I spend a fair amount of time um, trying to figure out what evidence is available on anything I'm writing about and and what's the right way to assemble it or think about it so that 
readers can um, are are informed and you know either can agree or disagree with me, obviously, but know where I'm coming from and and, and why it came to the conclusion that I came to. And it's quite it's quite funny, isn't it? Because some of the people reading it, are, your articles are the policymakers. Mm-hmm. So there's this weird weird system going on this feedback loop no? yes so some of the pieces that i write i'm writing specifically with um that audience in mind you know the, the people oh, wow. the people who are the policy makers i'm hoping that the people in the white house or the federal reserve or in congress the people who actually have the power to make these decisions are are reading what i'm writing um and you know i i can't say that they they always do what I want them to do or that I have unique influence or anything like that. But I, I do try to keep that in mind. How, how will this be perceived by the people who have the power to do the thing that I'm urging happen? Um, and then there are other things, but, I, but I'm still trying to write in such a way that it's accessible to a broader audience. And then there are some things that I'm writing that are really not about, you know, um, that, that are not so much focused at policymakers, but are about helping the public understand an issue. A lot of, I write an opinion column and it has an argument, but a lot of what I do is a little bit more explanatory. And so I'm, I'm going through like, why is it that, um, I'm thinking of something I wrote recently, why is it that rents have uh, gone up on low income people here in the United States, even as they've mm. gone down for uh, rich people in the past year? Or, you know, how, how do we think through what these dynamics are and what the possible uh, remedies might be for people who are struggling to pay their their bills, um, or you know, increase inf- affordable housing or, or whatever. So some of what I do is is more explanatory. But the, yeah, there are certain things that I write where um, I am hopeful that, given my platform at the Washington Post, that there are um, power for people who are reading it and who might be mm-hmm. persuaded by what I have to say. Maybe it happens both because maybe it's so complicated. A lot of the senators don't understand it and they say, I'll wait till Catherine's written about it and I'll, I'll understand <laughs> I don't, it. I don't know that I really have that much standing with uh, with these folks. Um, this is so This is so simple. Even even Trump, even President can understand <laughs> maybe, it. Maybe, maybe. Um, but I mean, it, it, is, it is something that I think journalists – have struggled with, or I, I at least have struggled with in the past several years, you know, how do you, how how much do you sort of dismiss those who disagree with you as lost causes, whether it's an important person in the White House or, you know, somebody in another part of the country who has very different lifestyle or whatever, different political views than I do. To what extent do I write them off and say they're never going to, you know, agree with me, yeah. and I don't, I shouldn't pander to them? And to what extent do I say no, I, you know, I, I shouldn't just be preaching to the choir. I should be trying to convince people who are likely to disagree with me to find common ground. Um, and I don't know that I've always walked that line perfectly, but it, it has been a challenge. I mean, it, it's, it's one of the um, ongoing conversations here in the United States about how do you deal, how, how do you think about bridging divides between, uh, for example, people who were very devoted supporters of President Trump, including um, supporting some of the more bigoted things that he said or did, do you just say, you know what, like that's a lost cause? And um, at, at the point that at the point that some of these people are, um, you know, unwilling to see their fellow humans as human, um, it's not worth trying to get them on board and you just have to try to focus on energizing the people who are more inclined to do things that you, you know, think are politically productive, policy wise productive, or do you, do you try to broaden the tent? I don't know. It's a very difficult question. Um, and depending on the day of the week that you talk to me, I have different views about, <laughs> about has the, it ever the right strategy. That- has it ever happened that one of these policymakers or someone in power has come to you and said quietly on the side, thanks for that, that really informed me? Yes, yes, that has occasionally happened. Um, 
And, um, you know, sometimes it might be that I'm writing something that they already agreed with. And hmm. so they say, oh, that was a great piece, you know, supporting whatever change to the immigration system or change to the tax code. And, and, you know, they're, they're happy to have me as an ally and, um, and that's nice to hear, but it's not mm -hmm. as rewarding as when I hear someone say, whether it's a policymaker or otherwise, that um, they they actually felt like they learned something from whatever it was that I wrote. And and my uh, my objective is to convince people, obviously, of things that I believe are true, but also to help people not not just to tell people what they already know or what they already believe, but to help them like learn something different. I mean, my job is to uncover interesting information and uh, present it in a way that is that is accessible um, to the general public, not just to the experts who already know about it, uh, and help people come to conclusions about what they should do with that information. So, um, you know, so I, I do try to do, as I said, quite a bit of original reporting um, and and tell people things that they didn't already know. Either they, either it's a specific fact that they didn't already know, such as what's going on with the rental market, for example, or they hadn't thought about a particular issue in in that framework or connected dots in a particular way. So that I think of that as my job, where I can add value is helping people learn new things. I like learning new things. I like sharing that information with people, and uh, I try to use the platform that I have to improve public discourse so that we come to hopefully better, uh, you know, better policies, better conversation, better understanding of one another uh, by, by learning more about the world around us. Yeah, that's great. That's like, you know, when I read an op when I read an op ed, it's always to get some new insight, some new way of thinking about something, and and that's what I try and do with my songs as well. There's always an an angle, you know, like a a funny a twist or something, and and you know when you've when you've read a good op ed, you can it's something that you can you have this piece of knowledge now or this insight, and you can you tell other people maybe the water cooler or you know have you are and they talk everyone's talking about this issue, and then you talk about it in a way that is that insightful, and then. They're just using your material, but um, you know. Well, look, they don't have to credit me. As I said, if if it's an issue that I care about, um, I'm happy to have more people talking about it. Particularly if it's something that, as I said, might go under the radar because it's complicated, because there are sexier things in the news, or because uh, people just hadn't realized that the, mm. for whatever reason, hadn't realized that the problem existed. So, you know, an example of that, of that recently for me might be something on um, the refugee resettlement system here in the United States. There's been a lot of attention paid to the problems at the southern border here in the United States, where there's been a, a surge of uh, people trying to claim asylum and many unaccompanied minors. Uh, separately from that, though, there is this thing called the refugee resettlement system, which is a different procedure through which people who are fleeing persecution or violence might uh, might apply through. There are people who are not already in the United States, whereas if you're seeking asylum, you're already here, you've, you're at a port of entry or you're within our borders. Uh, the refugee system is separate, and a lot of people don't realize that um, it's basically still pretty much shut down, that Trump had put in some draconian restrictions um, for both the number of people who could come in and the criteria that would allow them to be eligible to become refugees to the United States, basically effectively barring anyone from Muslim or African countries. And Biden had pledged to um, undo those changes over a month ago, I think, um, maybe almost two months ago at this point. It was sometime in, in February, early February. So they're in camps there or what's this? Yeah, these are people in, in refugee camps around the world or, or otherwise generally um, displaced from their homes or-, or In America or, or just no, all the, around the world? No, all around the world, not in America. Okay. So these are these, so there's a, a, a refugee system that is, is not unique to the United States. It's run by the uh, UN High Commission on Refugees and they vet people- um, who might be living in refugee camps or, or otherwise, uh, you know, 
at, at uh, risk for their lives and confirm that they are, in fact, victims of some form of persecution, that their lives are in danger, that they are not a national security risk, et cetera. And then the UNHCR re- refers those people to other countries, one of which is the United States. And historically, the United States had been kind of the world leader in mm. taking in- Bring, bring me your cold, your hungry, your tired, your poor, whatever. Mm-hmm. I can't, that's probably completely wrong, but yeah. It's that's close enough. Spirit. It's close enough. Close yeah, that's enough. this. Yeah. Um, um, you're, you're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses yearning to breathe free. That's on the, the inscribed on the base of the Statue of Liberty here in the States, not far from where I live actually. And, um, anyway, historically the United States had been a world leader in accepting refugees and the system was almost entirely shut down by president Trump. Um, and basically because he didn't like immigrants of any kind, <laughs> hmm. uh, whether they were coming because they were fleeing persecution or they were coming for job opportunities or what have you. And Biden, President Biden had pledged to undo those restrictions and then never did. And so this is the kind of thing, the kind of, I'm I'm bringing this up. This is sort of a long Mm. digression as an example of the kind of thing that I like to write about because people don't realize that Biden never overturned it's, it's very, uh, there are a lot of things in the immigration system here in the United States that are, are complicated to undo that Trump had done. This is not one of them. Biden just needs to sign some paperwork that says, okay, we're basically, we're no longer going to say if you're from a Muslim country <laughs> that you can't yeah. come um, or, or whatever, you know, whatever the restrictions may be. And he still hasn't done it. And so this is one of these things where it's like, I wrote it. Um, I know that the people at the White House are not happy that I wrote this because Biden uh-huh. is getting criticized for um, various other things related to immigration, including on the Southern border, which as I said, Sounds like a similar issue, but it's actually a completely different legal system and everything and vetting system. Um, And my hope is that maybe that wasn't the most read thing on the Washington Post website that day, but there'll be enough people who read it and who learn, learn this thing is happening that they didn't know was happening, who might be upset about it, who will contact their member of Congress and um, who will in, in turn try to place pressure on wow. the White House to do this. So it hasn't changed yet, so I can't claim that I've played any part no, so far hey. in, in, in changing um, policy, but I, I hope that in my writing about it and others who have, have been trying to draw attention to it, that there will be some you know growing momentum, some pressure put on the White House yeah. to, to make what I think is a relatively simple policy change that is the right thing to do. So those are the kinds of stories that I'm attracted to, things that... Again, like they're not getting a ton of attention. Um, there, are, there are people's lives that who are, that are affected in this case. You know, there people are fleeing death threats. Um, and uh, sorry, I'm getting a phone call. I apologize. <laughs> um, and um, in any event, uh, that that I have been blessed with this platform um, where I can reach a lot of people, some of whom are quite powerful people and, and hopefully add to the chorus of people who in, encourage policymakers to do the right thing. Those are the kinds of stories that I like to write about. That's great. So, I mean, you're publishing two, two, two um, articles per week, so you're doing lots of different issues. Do you see these reoccurring themes or these red lines? And have you ever, if you're going, I mean, one day, I, I'm sure you will write a book. Have you thought about what that would be? Um, uh, so there are certain recurrent themes in my work. Uh, I, you know, there are topic areas that I gravitate toward, as I mentioned, things related to the economy. And there's plenty of material about that right now, job loss, things like that, immigration, um, uh, and, and it basically, one of the things that I like to write about a lot that's a, a theme in my work is how can the state better serve its constituents? And what does that mean? What does that look like? I think one of the premises of the Trump administration amongst other allies of Trump had been, well, the best way that the government can serve the people is by kind of getting out of the way. 
and by eliminating as many regulations as possible. For example, that regulations um, overall are burdensome and they make people's lives worse. They make business more costly. And there are, are obviously elements of truth to that. There are lots of bad regulations on the books, but there are also lots of good regulations on the books. And simply framing the issue as more regulations bad, fewer regulations good, I think kind of misses the more substantive point of like, how do you design good regulations? How do you think about having a government that puts the public interest first and thinks about the possible consequences of um, the distributional consequences of removing some sort of ordinance. So for example, you know, the Trump administration removed a number of environmental regulations. They rolled back regulations on um, methane, on fine particulate matter, on uh, fuel efficiency standards for cars, a, a whole host of things. The argument being that those imposed costs on businesses. But then you also have to look at the other side of the ledger. Okay, maybe it imposes co some costs on businesses, but also extends the lives of people who no longer mm -hmm. are breathing dirty air or drinking poisonous water or, or whatever the, the particular measure is. So one theme that I often write about is what is the role of the state in, in regulating commerce? How do you think about these kinds of cost benefit analyses? And is there a, a way to improve them so that they um, better capture the true impact on public welfare and the, again, the, the distributional impact. Like maybe if you, um, uh, you know, have a regulation on the books that where it looks like overall the, the, the dollar value of the benefits outweigh the costs, but all of the costs are borne by, um, poor people of color and all of the benefits are accruing mm -hmm. to, you know, well-off individuals or corporations maybe weigh those things differently. So, so th this is sort of a set of, it's like an undercurrent of much of my writing as well. How do you think about the regulatory state and its purpose in um, encouraging commerce, but also protecting the public and what are the trade-offs there? So it's like, it's, it's something that I, I don't, always write about explicitly, but it's, it's a, often like a, as I said, an undercurrent in, in the kinds of stories that I gravitate toward. Um, and then how do you think about the, you know, the other dimensions that are not just purely economic, um, the, the moral implications of these sorts of regulations? Um, and so, you know, I, I could see myself eventually writing a book maybe on something related to that question. I don't know exactly what it would look like. But it's sort of like, uh, how do you have uh, a, a healthy government function within a mixed economy? And, um, and how do you increase the public's trust that the government is actually doing things that are, that are designed to help the public rather than to enrich very well-connected special interest groups or um, politicians themselves or whoever, you know, how, how do you both have a system in place that, um, that helps uh, come up with better, good, but good policy, good regulation, but also convince the public that the system is working because at some point it can be, again, a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people don't believe that government is acting in their interests, then they, then it, then the, and then it won't work. Like I think a mm. good example of that was um, with the development of vaccines last year. That there was so much distrust that there would really be adequate um, evaluation of the safety and efficacy of vaccines because. President Trump, amongst others, just kept saying, like, we're going to get it out no matter what, effectively, mm. like making promises that he couldn't keep, that people said, well, how do I really know that the FDA, which is our regulatory body here in the States that, re that monitors 
the safety of drugs and approves new drugs, how do I really know that they're doing their job? Even if they are doing their job, how do I really know? So anyway, so, so are there ways in which like having a, uh, a, a robust, well-functioning government can actually improve um, the ability of the economy to work because maybe people will be more willing to take the vaccines if they actually, if they think if they trust the government to do the right thing. I don't know. I realize this is all pretty abstract. Um, <laughs> I got to get but, a song out of this. So uh, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. This is I, I'm I'm realizing as I'm talking. I got, I got the word poli- policy written down. Policy. Okay. 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 That's I've a good that. start. Mm-hmm. That's. Uh... <laughs> um, but but these are the kinds of questions that motivate the stories mm. that I gravitate toward. Yeah, because I tried with the, draw attention to a, a, a subject with a song that needs that needs you know this light shining on it. So I try and do good, you know, like you're doing. So um, do you think um, do you think part of the problem is that you know you have you have so many amazing companies in America who've evolved very quickly? Do you think the government has been left behind a bit also with its technology and it's still using old operating systems and you know it's it's dusty? Is it is that Yes, um, certainly. There are a lot of reasons why government uh, doesn't operate as efficiently as it should, and one of which is arguably that there's like this there's re- resistance in the United States to invest in good government and to mm. pay public officials what they could make in the private sector. And yeah. so, if you are unwilling to pay for you know, the, the market rate for software engineers, then it's going to be, if, if you're the government, um, because we have like a lot of restrictions on how much people can get paid if they work for the government, then you're going to have trouble d- recruiting talent and um, would, would you go getting good people. Would I? Would I? Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I I like my job as as an outside observer, as a, as a, a critic, you know, as, mm. as opposed to one who was actually, I, I, I'm happy with, with what I'm doing now. I, w- I wouldn't want to join the government, but I, I'm very supportive of people who do want to go into lives of public service um, and who take jobs often below the pay levels that they could get in the private sector um, who are, who are willing to do good. But I think you can't solely rely on people's altruism to recruit mm. good talent and, um, you know, people have other, you think all sorts it of other. Like, mm-hmm. You think it should be like jury service that, you know, anyone that wants to be a politician shouldn't be allowed to do it. And you should, there should be like a lottery and you have to do five years in public service. You know, if you reach a certain level or. That's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know that I want a lottery system for who's pulling the levers of government, but I think we should be doing more to make it a, a feasible career choice for people who, for whom it is out of reach, including by paying, you know, arguably paying members of the Senate and Congress more money. It's like a controversial thing here mm. because they, they still make a fair amount of money, but it's expensive to be a member of Congress because you have to have a, a place to live both in the area that, re- that you're representing sure, um, yeah. and in Washington, D.C., and um, and that's hard to do if you're just a regular Joe and you didn't inherit a lot of money or you didn't make a lot of money before you ran for office. So, you know, well, you I'm relying in- on donors and lobbyists. I mean, that makes it inherently right. susceptible so, to corruption. Yeah. So on the one hand, as I said, there's this this instinct in the United States like, well, we should be spending as little money on government as possible whether that means paying the salaries of people who are elected to office or the career officials who work in various agencies, don't pay them very much money um, and, and don't give them the resources that they need to do their jobs. But on the other hand, you end up with worse outcomes. You end up, you know, basically the only people who can afford to take those jobs are the people who come from partic- very particular socioeconomic backgrounds and are not necessarily representative of the country as a whole. Do you, um, just out of interest, which state would you move to, which has the be- which has the the best health and education? Uh, well, in economics, there's a concept called revealed preference, which is you don't ask people what they say they would do; you look at what what decisions they've they've already actually made because they're you know cheap talk, right? And I've lived in New York for 
over a decade now. So I guess that my revealed preference is living in New York, but there are other places that I fantasize about living, certainly. Um, and I'm in New York partly for work reasons. Uh, you know, there are, it's, it's interesting how much like uh, COVID has also affected my, my thinking on this. Like if we're talking about how functional is a government, you can look at how well different states have handled this. And I don't know what, what state has handled it the best. I think probably here in the United States, I think Vermont has had the fewest cases uh, or the, you know, the, the lowest case rate or something of coronavirus. So that makes it look pretty attractive to me right now. Uh, and also Vermont is beautiful. Oh, yeah. But if you've ever been. <laughs> I have. Uh, it's lovely. Yeah. So. Well, you're not far away. New York State. Not far is away. Next, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But part of the reason why they've had so few COVID cases, I don't know if this is still the situation, but they were really restricting how much people could travel in and out of the state. So maybe they don't want me mm. there. I don't know. Okay. All <laughs> right. Great. Well, I think we're coming to the end there. I mean, obviously okay. I could keep. I hope to, some of this was helpful. I don't know. I feel like I've, we've been talking about all sorts of very abstract things. I can do an instrumental song. It's no problem. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. just a mood piece. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, it's great. I mean, there's so much to touch on. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I've had so many interesting guests, you know, and they've all, um, it helps when they've written a book. I think you need to, to need to I write, need to write book a book because... solely to give you material for for this podcast, if nothing else. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I spoke to Brian Kaplan, the economist, and he wrote... Um, he wrote a book, uh, an illustrated book about um, open borders, um, mm. and he had these uh, these keyhole solutions. So every time, every every objection, you have a little, you know, a little like a, a red card instead of a blue, a blue card instead of a green card, and, and things like that. So yeah, so it solves a lot of problems. But um, how do you choose your guests? I'm just curious because I I got this email out of the blue from you, and well, I didn't I'm know. Sitting here- I'm in a cupboard. I'm in a cupboard in Italy. So, okay. and I'm reaching out to to the to the guests on who've been on, and who people who have famous people. So it's more. Of I'm a not massive... sure I count as famous, but sure, well, I'll I'll take well, it. Okay. I think uh, famous <laughs> is pretty. Uh, you're in the public eye for sure, and interesting people. People who can, you know, I'm trying to write songs which um, give people food for thought. So I need the food first, you know. Otherwise, okay. um, maybe this just be about my my garden things like that so i'm sure there's a market for that too you know all right great well well thanks so much for taking the time of course i i look forward to figuring out how you or or learning how you figured out how to assemble all of this into something musical me too and and uh keep me posted all right thanks Catherine. okay thanks jack bye 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 i wanna live in a life when it's real welfare Not just for the sick But real health care Along where the police are loved And trust in the legal system's there To always give you justice A prison is seen As the very last resort Education for all is the top priority For all children, all minorities I wanna live in a country that cares about me That cares about me 
there you go, Woody Guthrie for the 21st century. Thanks to Catherine, I would never have come up with that song without her. And thanks to my musicians, Maurizio San Nicola, Massimino Vozza, and Luigi Falcione. And thanks to my researcher, Dori Verbo. Please follow Pod Songs on Instagram, uh, Spotify, Deezer, YouTube. I go on and on, you know where they are. Um, and also... Let me send me some feedback, you know, how am I doing here? Because uh, sometimes it feels like I'm speaking to the void here. And it would be lovely to get some messages from you all. I do get a few, but it's always nice to get some more. And also an honorary mention to the Ethereum Society, the teachings of which led me to start this project, serving the service, helping those who help others. You can learn more about the society at ethereus.org. Until next time, have a great day.